We have interpretation in English and French, Spanish, and Korean. And there has been a link that was set、uh, sent earlier in the chat to connect to Portuguese.、Um, perhaps the organizers can resend that link because I think it's been moved up.、Um, lastly, because there are many languages being interpreted today, if all speakers could please speak slowly and clearly so that interpreters can do their jobs. And everybody can participate in the meeting.、Um, lastly, for panelists, we will be disabling your video, which means that we will not be able to see you.、Um, but when you are about to speak, your video request will come through, and then your video will be enabled after you click yes.、Um, is there anything else? Before we get started, otherwise, I will hand it over to David Boys. And thank you for joining everyone. We have 288 of you on. David, over to you. Thanks, Irene.、Uh, and welcome, everybody, to the opening session of the Global Trade Union、uh, Assembly. I'm really honored to give the opening remarks to this unique gathering of trade unionists from around the world. Uh, my name is David Boys. I'm Deputy General Secretary of Public Services International. We're a global union federation founded in 1907, and we now bring together 700 affiliated unions from 155 countries, representing over 30 million workers.、Uh, about 60% of our members work in health and social services. Most of them are women. Most of them are underpaid. And with COVID, we see that most of them have really dangerous working conditions. But our health members over the past months tell us time and again they're not heroes. They don't want to be known as heroes. They are workers, and as such, they demand respect and dignity and their rights. Importantly, they ask for the tools to do their jobs safely and professionally. But we've seen, both in COVID and in Ebola and previous epidemics, too many have been made sick or killed for lack of personal protective equipment. And even before COVID, many of them were seriously overworked with high job stress and again underpaid. For us, COVID shows the impact of the core structures of the neoliberal global machine. First, from the perspective of PSI, this machine maligns the role of government and denigrates public servants. It extols the individual consumer. It extols the markets and the profit motive. It has imposed years of structural adjustment in the South and austerity in the North, which means basically cutting spending on public services, including crucially on staffing levels, on wages, on training, on equipment and material. It also has imposed privatization to supposedly improve efficiency and access to core public services when run by for-profit corporations. But we've also seen the global supply chains, where highly mobile capital seeks countries with the lowest wages and labor rights, cheap access to natural resources, and low environmental protections. Supply chains which can provide us with all sorts of consumer goods, but can't protect against COVID, can't deliver the health supplies when and where we need them. This global pandemic has shown us the deep cracks in our system—not just healthcare, but social protection, occupational safety and health, reliance on women to provide unpaid domestic services, on migrants, on low-wage food workers. And remember, while many while many of us are practicing confinement, the climate crisis is accelerating. So clearly, the dominant neoliberal model fails to deliver what people 
and planet need. This assembly is the work of 58 convening trade union bodies, among them PSI, several national centers, and many individual unions from more than 30 countries. This started as a group of unions preparing for the next UN climate summit in Glasgow, which had just been canceled because of COVID. Our questions and concerns on that call led to this assembly, which reflects our collective willingness to strengthen our movement's response to the current crisis. Well, how much is it? Unions all over the world are doing their best to handle enormous numbers of job losses, unpaid wages, and employers and financiers that want to take advantage of the crisis at our expense. Informal and migrant workers are suffering even more as the majority of them don't have the protections of union contracts to back them up. This pandemic and its social and economic impacts presents a test for our movement, unlike anything we've seen in our lifetimes. And to pass this test, we need everyone involved. It's therefore encouraging that more than 800 people from 200 unions in dozens of countries have registered for the assembly. It expresses our instinct to connect with each other and to share experiences and ideas about how to shape a new future, because it is more clear than ever before that we don't want to return to business as usual. And today we have technologies that allow us to broaden and deepen the debate around what we can do as a global movement. For every trade unionist around the world, internationalism can be a source of inspiration and hope. There is both a will and a way. Allow me at the start to acknowledge the many late night attendees in Nepal, Pakistan, the Philippines, India, Sri Lanka, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Australia, and New Zealand. We hope to keep this dynamic enough and fluid enough that you're able to stay awake and engaged. For us, the African continent is well represented. And we're especially glad to see that we have a strong response from the Middle East and North Africa region in Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Palestine. From Latin America, we have enthusiastic support from all of our unions. And we'd like to thank especially Argentina, Colombia, and Ecuador for engaging uh, over the past uh, weeks and months. In recent days, we've made connections with the independent unions in Russia and Belarus, welcome comrades. Canadian unions have been particularly solid and the US has engaged a lot of people in this process. I wanna also recognize the work of the planning committee, which is ongoing, which consists of the convening unions uh, who have been working uh, to shape this event for the past three months. But a special thanks go to the TUED team in New York City, which convened the original climate call I mentioned at the beginning, and then agreed to facilitate this assembly. Sean, Irene, John, and Lala, they've been working around the clock to make this a, a success. And the School of Labor and Urban Studies that are also working behind the scenes to make this happen. I also want to give a thanks to the Rose of Luxembourg Stiftung for its support for TUED over the years. They have all supported us for this series of virtual meetings. But it's up to us to carry the work forward in these meetings and after. This global crisis prevents massive threats, but also opportunities to work together, to connect the dots, and especially to connect our struggles, not just for labor rights, but for the rights of all people and living beings on this planet. And next, it's my pleasure to introduce Catalina Caro Galvis of the Mesa Social Minero Energetica in Colombia, who will acknowledge the land and lead a moment of reflection. And then Irene Hongping Shen, who will tell us more about the assembly. Thank you very much and good work to all of us. Catalina, es para usted. Gracias.
Al comenzar esta reunión, tomemos un tiempo para reconocer que la tierra, so, que el territorio que estamos pisando en este the momento ha sido tierra indígena desposeída, has been an indigenous land taken by the colonial colonists before us. So let's tradicionales honor de esta all of the indigenous people who are the guardians of this earth Recordemos and of traditional knowledge. Let's remember that everyone has the responsibility of decolonizing this earth, making sure that we dismantle systemic racism and other oppression systems. We are also looking for indigenous towns and people to help us heal our relationship with the earth, water, the nature, and between each other. And last but not least, let's stop, reflect, pray, and cry for those that have been lost due to coronavirus. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Catalina. Uh, my name is Irene Hongping Shen with Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. We are helping to coordinate the Global Trade Union Assembly, as David mentioned earlier. We've had a great response to the assembly. Um, we're very excited about the enthusiasm and registration will stay open through all of the meetings. So please continue to outreach to your networks even after today and encourage people to register. We'll post the link to the website on, uh, in the chat. So right now I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the structure and timeline of the Global Trade Union Assembly. Today's meeting marks the first of seven meetings of the assembly. The next meeting will start on August 20th, also a Thursday. Following that meeting will be four sessions focused on specific topics. You can see all those topics on the website under the program tab where there's a small description for each of the meetings. The final session of the series will be a closing session on September 10th, and that will mark the end of this particular series of the Global Trade Union Assembly. There will also be ways to stay engaged with the assembly and each other during the weeks between this meeting and the next on August 20th. We will post questions that attendees write in from today's meeting to the website so that everybody can engage and interact with those questions if you choose. Um, you just have to go to the website and we will be posting them after this meeting is over. In addition, there are other ways that we'll hear about later on how to engage. There are also others in our movement who are thinking about ways to stay connected with each other between meetings. So in that vein, I want to introduce another comrade who has been thinking about the engagement of young workers. Uh, Leigh Brown is from the Automobile Boatyard Transport Equipment and Allied Senior Staff Association. He is the National Organizing Secretary of the Union. So I'm going to hand the floor over to Leigh. I see you, comrade. Hello. Um, you know, I cannot hear you. Uh, are you in the English channel? for interpretation, or I guess it doesn't matter which channel you're in. Can others hear, Lay? No. Mm. No. Same no. Ah, better, yes. I think it was the mic. Yeah, uh, but, um, good comments. Um, my name is Light Brown from Auto Business Association in Nigeria. Well, uh, young workers uh, and women across the globe are, are particularly impacted by the COVID 19 crisis. 
when to ILO uh, um, data is going to be a set of data. Last year, opportunities to engage and expand and uh, fight along with all sections of the world. From that, we propose that global trade in your assembly 2020. Comrade, so young workers and Comrade, we're having trouble hearing to, you. To, to, to okay. Concretely, we are proposing a meeting of, of young workers and organizers with support of uh, Global Trade Union Assembly 2020 and trade unions that the youth members. We believe, we believe this meeting. Organizing Brown. experience. Comrade Brown, can you can you try? We're really not hearing share. you. We're, we're really not hearing you. It's really distorted. Uh, maybe you're going to have to cut your video. Irene, is that what you would suggest? Yeah. Why don't you try that, Lay? It might help the to stabilize the connection. We can't hear you. Um, it's going in and out. We are also going to post um, your comments in the chat so people can read along. Um, but try stopping the video and seeing if we can hear. And then starting over, but you got to cut the video. Yeah. Can you turn off your video, Lay? Yeah, I'm doing that right now. Great. Okay. Excellent. Oh. Well, um, I will just I mean, start over with that again. Um, I mean, like, like, I was, like I said earlier, Young workers and women across the globe are disproportionate. According to a recent ILO data, more than one in six healthcare provide for us opportunities to engage, expand, and fight along with all sections of the working class, particularly the young workers. We thus propose uh, that the Global Trade Union Assembly 2020. Uh, um, she provides a platform for young workers and organizers globally to engage, sometime, sometime in August. Concretely, we are proposing a global virtual meeting of young workers and organizers with the support of Global Trade Union Assembly 2020 and trade unions that registered for the assembly, particularly in mobilizing their youth members. We believe this proposed virtual uh, meetings for August will provide for us opportunities to share organizing experiences uh, prior to and during the pandemic. Also, it will ensure more participation of young workers in the Global Trade Union Assembly 2020. So, um, so I think, yeah, if we adopt that proposal, it will go a long way in bringing more young workers into the assembly. Thanks, comment. Thank you, Leigh, for those words. And yes, we look very much forward to um, your pulling together a uh, youth engagement piece of the Global Trade Union Assembly. Very exciting. Um, we're going to move on. I just want to remind people, because I know people probably came in late, that there is interpretation and um, there are four channels to go into. You can join English, French, Spanish, or Korean. And it is recommended to mute original audio so that you can hear more clearly. There's a slide that is going up where you can see the instructions in case you have joined late. Please follow those instructions and select the proper language channel. If you want to listen in Portuguese, um, the Portuguese link has just been put into the link, uh, sorry, into the chat box. So you can join that channel for Portuguese listening as well. Thanks, everyone. Um, we are now going to move into a brief video, um, which we hope will energize you. And uh, I will hand that over to the organizers now. Thanks, everyone. 
Also, we are up to 364 attendees from around the world. Welcome. We're not getting any audio. Can we start the video again with audio? And full screen. Nadia, I think the uh, video is still no audio is coming through. There is a note here. I had this problem recently and I had to open a new page in the browser and do the video from there. I don't know if that is the issue here. Great, thank you for that. Now we'll move on to the next portion of the program. I think uh, John has some announcements on how um, attendees can engage with this next portion. Yes, thanks, Irene. Um, hope you can all hear me. Apologies for the quality of the video. My computer decided that yesterday would be a fine day for the webcam to stop working. Um, obviously, for an event like this, you have to be a bit creative um, in the kinds of participation that you can uh, try to, to build in. Uh, so we've tried to come up with some solutions there. For this portion of the program, um, if attendees could please use the Q&A function, uh, you can use that to uh, ask a question by typing it in. Uh, you can comment on questions that other people have asked. You can like questions with the uh, thumb, thumbs up icon. Um, during the meeting today, speakers will not be answering questions um, in, uh, in real time, but we will take the questions from today's Q&A and we'll post them to the website uh, so that uh, the discussion can continue and anyone can respond even after today's program. Um, during this part of the program, only the organizers will use the chat function uh, to post information related to the program. So you can look for information there, but for your interaction, it will be in the Q&A rather than in the chat. Um, and just a reminder as well for, to the speakers, if you could please speak slowly and clearly uh, for the interpreters uh, so that we can make sure that we capture everything that you're saying. I think that's it from me.
I think over to you, Sean. Yes. Um, can comrades hear me? Yes. Yes, great, excellent. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is <coughs> Sean Sweeney. I coordinate trade unions for energy democracy based at the School of Labor and Urban Studies. We are um, now going into a segment of the conversation uh, called A World to Win, but how? I want to, this is at the part of the program where we consider what the pandemic and the current economic crisis means for unions. We are all reflecting on what changes that need to be made in terms of how we organize and what changes we are capable of making. And we also are questioning or asking how the crisis might alter our movement's political goals and strategy. Uh, I need to start off by giving apologies for Zuelenzi Mavavi, the General Secretary of the South African Federation of Trade Unions. His sister-in-law died of COVID-19 uh, uh, during the evening, South Africa time. And he sent me a text this morning saying he's at the hospital. Um, this is a, obviously a great personal loss to Zueli and his family, but he is, it means he's unable to join us. Um, uh, this time, but I'm sure in future assembly sessions we can hear from Zueli. He also lost his uncle and uh, to COVID and his sister, but his sister died of something different, but it's been a particularly tragic week for him. So we all send our solidarity uh, to Zueli and his family in South Africa. Um, we've got two other contributors to this session, Adolfo Vieri, the Secretary of International Relations, of the CTA Argentina Autonomous. Um, Sue, uh, Adolfo, or Fito as he's sometimes known, um, and I met um, probably a decade ago when we started working on international uh, issues. And we're also joined by Sarah Nelson, the international president of the Association of Flight Attendants, Communication Workers of America here in the United States. So I'm going to pose a a separate question to each of uh, these two comrades. And we're gonna start with uh, Fito. Um, Fito, recently you wrote an essay for Progressive International. In that essay, you wrote the following words, and I think we can put that in the chat. Regaining control of privatized goods and institutions, municipalizing energy sources, democratizing Access to energy are all basic elements for the transition to another production and consumption model, a model based on a different relationship with nature and among human beings. If we want to continue living on this planet, we have to think about another world of work. My question to Fito is, how do we do this, Fito? How do we get from where we are now to where we need to go in terms of um, uh, changing our whole production and consumption model. And please stand by before Fito answers that there may be a snap poll. We're gonna poll our, um, poll our attendees to get their opinion in real time on some of these core issues. So I'll stop there and see if uh, Fito uh, can take up that question. Bueno. Muchas gracias. Eh, eh, bueno, en base a lo que much. me pregunta well, Son, on, uh, what, uh, creo que Sean is asking, el modo de poner en marcha esta agenda the way of requiere de una mirada amplia starting with this agenda requires a wide overview sindical. from the unions creo regarding our representation. Tenemos que interpelar I think that we need to involve all of the workers who are working eh, informally and all of the organizations de Como así también, that have to do with the work relationship es as well as eh, que avancemos it is necessary más para that que we voz, advance in more eh, participative democracies so that our eh, voice can have en nuestra More hoja de ruta weight. para pensar eh, otro mundo on our roadmap to think of a different world es necesario for labor por un it lado, is necessary eh, reorganizar on the one hand las cadenas de valor 
teniendo en cuenta eh, value chain, el valor eh, social y ambiental eh, the social que value and the environmental la de valor. value en ese camino creo que va a ser inevitable On that path, I believe it is inevitable to advance towards a global trend, that is, the nationalization of claro no cambios, eh, It is clear that changes are not going to happen eh, without para, political will and decision. And for that eh, will, voz, it is required to eh, amplify our voice. Necesitamos ampliar conciencia de la injusticia del sistema en el que vivimos. Regarding the injustice of the system eh, in which we live, entiendo as well as que es necesario eh, pensar I know that it is la posibilidad to de otra globalización. The possibility of another globalization, and of course, to consider de as una well que tenga the construction como base la of a society that can have as a base the dignity Gracias. in common good. Thank you. Just checking to see if I'm unmuted. You are unmuted. Okay, great, great. Sarah, welcome. Um, thanks for being here with us today. Um, you've been in the news a lot lately, which is very encouraging from a US trade union perspective as a president of a union that's uh, on the cutting edge of not just before COVID on the cutting edge of change, but certainly since COVID started with the troubles in the aviation sector. You, um, in your speech to QP last year, you made some, um, you know, some very inspiring remarks, which I'd like to uh, quote you on and see if, um, and ask you a question around that. Your, in your speech, you said that workers are ready to fight and you stress the importance of solidarity and internationalism. You raised the need for a general strike. That made the news. But you also asked, what is the labor movement waiting for? And so my question is, what opportunities do you see for growing workers' power in the U.S. and internationally? And what should unions do that they're not doing now or not already doing? Um, there's also on your screen, before Sarah answers, um, a, a Global Assembly poll in progress. So please, um, please vote. And so give us a sense of how you're feeling about this particular question uh, that, that actually Fito, uh, Fito asked if unions and social movements should focus on retaking control of public goods and privatizing institutions. Do you agree or disagree? It looks like we're getting a very strong response to that poll. So I'll hand it over to Sarah um, for her contribution. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. And I would just like to start by um, saying that our hearts um, are with Zueli and his family. I'm very sorry uh, for the loss overnight of our sister. And uh, I'd like to start with recognizing that we need to understand labor's roots. We need to understand where we come from and that this world is ours. This is, world is ours to own um, and to live in and to make work for our, our families. Uh, Mother Jones told us over a hundred years ago, the great labor organizer in the United States, she said, the capitalists say there is no need of labor organizing, but the fact that they themselves are continually organizing shows their real beliefs. The capitalists want the most labor for the least money. The laborers want the most money for the least labor. Workers produce wealth and build the world's palaces, but they neither use the wealth nor dwell in the palaces. If you would only realize that you hold the whole solution, the, the solution to the whole problem in your own hands, 
you could settle the whole question easily. If, for instance, instead of striking in small groups, every industry in America were to hold up, and I'll add, every industry around the world were to hold up, the capitalist would be obliged to yield to any and all demands, for the world could simply not go on. So COVID-19 has demonstrated two things about work. All work is essential. And the jobs that have been marginalized and undervalued, grocery workers, farm workers, sanitation workers, delivery workers, teachers, transportation workers, domestic care workers, cleaners, and yes, flight attendants, do some of the most valuable work around our world. And second, an injury to one is truly an injury to all. As this pandemic is a threat to all of us, if it finds space to live in any of us. Choosing our safety or our, our economy is a false choice, and we are not disposable. We've seen hundreds of thousands of workers organically issuing new demands of their employees, employers or walking off the jobs for our own safety. People are talking about our rights at work and in our unions in entirely new ways. And for many white collar workers, the very nature of work may change forever. But at the same time, in countries like the US where our government has completely failed us, we're seeing mass unemployment unlike anything we've seen in over a hundred years. It would be easy to feel disempowered right now, especially with the isolation that social distancing brings. But we're also seeing tremendous solidarity and purpose. And we need to find ways to engage and harness that. The Black Lives Matter protests are a clear example of that. Tens of millions marching for weeks on end. And now a strike for Black Lives planned for July 20th. Workers who have never even thought about a union are suddenly looking for ways to win power and a voice at work. And we need to open our arms wide and make clear that unions are for all of us, for everyone who works. We are not a club, we are a movement. Unions also have a powerful role to change public policy. We took as an example, the approach that has happened within the European Union to how to address this economy. And we fought hard in the United States. We put forward a plan as aviation unions to make sure that our government would lock in place the first corporate bailout in our country that ensured that it was workers first. That was our unions that fought for that and won that. And what we got was continued paychecks for aviation workers and a requirement of the corporations that they couldn't lay anyone off. They couldn't furlough anyone. And at the same time, we roped in some of the worst corporate practices that everyone hates. We capped their executive compensation. We said no stock buybacks and no dividends, and you must keep workers on the job. You have to value our work. We're fighting for safety protections at work, and we're looking to extend all of this to other industries because our work is connected, and we are only stronger if we lift all of, all of us up together. On a global scale, we're seeing the difference between the short-term view of the corporate capitalists and the long-term thinking of responsible government. Now, I'm not saying the EU is perfect here, but the EU largely set a roadmap for how to responsibly address, address a crisis like this, while states like the US, Russia, and Brazil have used it to cover, uh, as cover to give corporations even more power. There are those who will take the opportunity of this crisis to try to turn it to their benefit. We have to understand that and we have to band together and fight back against it. If workers understood the power that we have, we could force our governments to take a different approach. We could force corporations to have to respond to us and our needs and value our work. If we understood that we should not just be getting pandemic pay to increase the amount of money to recognize the work that is essential right now, but that this is a moment to demand that we change the pay structure entirely, then we could lift the standards for work around the world. And we have to understand that this is not isolated to our own countries. 
We are a global market. We are a global workforce. And our work is tied together. We have the power in this moment to truly change things for the long term. And we have to understand that now is the time to help people understand that the trade union movement is a way to have sustained power for workers, to have to sustained interaction in public policy, and to take ownership of our world, to take on the crises that are coming at us fast, but that we can define, can work for workers as we form new jobs in a sustainable economy. So this is our charge. And as Mother Jones would say, you will fight and lose, fight and win, but you must fight. When we fight, sisters and brothers, we win. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Can the uh, comrades hear me and just get a sense from the organizers? Yes, we can hear you. That's lovely. Thanks for those rising, inspiring words, Sarah. You know, we got, I think, the results of the first poll. I don't know if Irene, uh, you have them handy, but uh, they're yes, quite I interesting. Just, I'm going to share them with everyone right now. This was the question for we asked that came out of Fito's comments about the need to take back what had been privatized and to extend public ownership, essentially. I think Irene is working on that now. S sorry, yeah, we um, because we're in a second poll right now, uh, we can't okay. publish the first poll's results. Okay, all right, but um, we have a second but, poll which comes out of Sarah's, sorry, John, did you wanna come in? I was just gonna say it was overwhelmingly, yeah. yes. Yes, yes. Um, we have a second poll in progress now, which is um, Sarah suggested in the US worker militancy is rising and that workers are ready to fight. Does that speak to your reality around the world? We're asking uh, attendees here to poll on that because uh, Worker consciousness and capacity and willingness to struggle is, as Sarah pointed out, hugely important, probably the most critical factor. We can have all the ideas, the best ideas and the best arguments, but unless we're, workers are willing to uh, mobilize around those ideas and self-organize, then uh, we will be able to rebuild the movement. So we're waiting for the results of both of those polls. I think we're in good shape. We have a few more minutes for this segment. Um, uh, Fito, I'd like to come back to you if that's okay and um, ask a, a follow-up question. When we met at the Rio Plus 20 talks in 2012, this was the Sustainable Development Conference where I first met you, I believe, you raised, there was a global trade union assembly then, the last um, one, um, um, that was the most recent one where there was a, 400 unions present. And there was quite a sharp discussion over the uh, approach the global trade union movement should take um, in terms of transitioning to a more sustainable, uh, ecologically and economically and socially sustainable system. And you, you from the floor called for a new discourse, uh, that unions should champion a new discourse. Do you feel that we've made progress in these eight years? And this is a particularly relevant question given the latest economic crisis. Um, if you could respond to that, and then maybe we can ask Sarah a follow-up question and before we move on to the final section of the program. Bueno, eh, um, well, creo que, um, I think Eight years after Rio Plus 20, the main flaws in the production and consumption system have deepened. I remember that in Porto Alegre in the year 2001, we were announcing that a different world was possible and in 2012 we arrived at Rio de Janeiro saying that we needed to go from a possible world to necessary world so I believe that we need to see beyond the pandemic and 
We also need to go through this recurring crisis in the capital because we lived in a richest concentration and inequality that are truly alarming. And the pandemic has indeed visibilized this inequality and this concentration of wealth, micro-owners that we nowadays have in the world. This is why it is paramount in this opportunity, in this crisis, which is by far not the first and definitely not the last one, we must find alternatives related mostly with how can we provoke a different distribution of wealth that targets dignity, as I said before, and that we can build and promote a basic universal rent for everyone and that we can move forward in the nationalization of companies that are strategic or strategic areas that must provide rights such as health and other rights as well that we have also advanced on. And mostly and mainly we have to imagine that the pandemic is an opportunity, something that needs to change our agenda. And in this agenda, the workers have a paramount role, not only in vindication, but also on having a cosmovision in politics with an excellent relationship with humanity as a whole and nature as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fito. Um, I mean, just before, I'd, I'd like to see if Sarah would like to ask a question of the attendees. Is there a yes, no question? I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, given um, the uh, nature of this global audience, it might be useful to get some feedback. By the way, while you're thinking, Sarah, um, your question um, on the question of worker militancy and willingness to struggle, does that speak to your reality, the attendees' realities in their different countries? 70% said yes, which I think is very good, and 30% said no, which is also a subject for discussion maybe at future assemblies. We're also, just to reiterate what um, others have said, we're asking for comrades on in the assembly to submit written documents. Uh, I won't go into more details on that now because I think it's going to come up later, but to deepen and broaden the discussion so we can really take the issues that are raised in this assembly uh, to a, a, a broader audience and also have them in a public uh, available space. So Sarah, do you, um, would you like to ask a question of the, of the, of the attendees? Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so the question I have is, do you know, would you be able to say, what is the strongest demand of the people that you represent? Would you be able to voice that? And in doing so, would you also be able to connect that to every different constituency that you represent? Uh, is there a demand that we can make together as workers to call on everyone with the question of what are we willing to do? In other words, is there a demand of workers that we can make and conduct a general strike around the world to back up those demands? So can we maybe pose that in a yes, no way? Like, is a general strike possible? In other words, from an organizing perspective, should we ask that question? 
a global general strike. If we plan well for it, and over, and obviously clear there's demands. A, there's a lot of there's a lot of other questions associated with that particular question. But I think that would be a good uh, poll to uh, put up to the to the group. Um, um, I think we have a couple more minutes. Fito, do you want to ask a question of the attendees? A question of that nature. Um, sí, um, yes. La pregunta es, eh, My question si is, tenemos noción o convencimiento do we understand or are we convinced of the strength that we have as a working class worldwide and if we have such conviction and understanding do we deserve to live a dignified life and much better than what we are seeing at the moment in different regions where the inequality and the distribution of the wealth is alarming and is mostly related to the death than with life. That would be my question. If we truly understand and are aware of our strength, or if we are not aware and we believe that we are in a weakness stance, when we are actually the 99% living in despair, while the 1% has gathered all the wealth in a non-dignifying way. Thank you for that, Vito. Um, I'm not sure if the organizers can synthesize that into a poll, but it's a very good question. Like, do we realize, do we understand our strength as workers? I think might be one way of doing it. Um, before we move on, I just want to give the results of the, uh, the, the poll that we just had. Would you, Sarah asked, would you be able to voice the strongest demand of the people you represent? Interestingly, 88% said yes and 14% said no. And um, it, the second question was, is a global general strike with clear demands possible? 78% said yes, and 24% said no. So Sarah's got her fist in the air, and I think we all share that feeling. Uh, and let's hope we can make it happen sooner rather than later. I'm afraid we're going to have to segue into the next session now, but I wanted to thank Fito and Sarah for being with us today. Uh, and we've got hundreds of people on the call and um, really thrilled by the react response we're getting to this idea of an assembly and great that you could both participate and we hope you stay around for the north south uh, discussions that are going to commence very very soon um i think we're going to uh hear from marie christine the international policy officer of cgt france the largest um, trade union central in in France, and she's going to join us now, I believe. As we're getting the video set up, I just want to announce that um, Fito's poll is also being um, responded to right now. And if interpreters can interpret the question, um, that would be great. Thanks. Hello, can everybody hear me? So start again. Hello, everyone. Um, as Sean indicated, uh, we're moving into a slightly uh, different part, or rather a continuation of uh, our program. Um, this part we have called Workers Without Borders. 
And um, the purpose of this part of the discussion is to initiate some dialogue between um, people from different latitudes um, and the great need for joint work and solidarity. So without any further ado, uh, let's move on to immediately into our first conversation. And that one will involve um, Aira Ferdals, who is an organizer with the United Workers Union of Australia, and Joshua Matter, who is General Secretary of Centro of the Philippines. Um, I think, Aira, you have the floor. Thank you, Marie. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, as Marie mentioned, my name is Ira Ferdas, and I will be uh, speaking with Joshua. Um, Joshua, are you there? Yes, hi, Ira. Good evening. Hi, Joshua. Good evening. Um, so let's get started with our topic. Um, so I'm going to ask Joshua a question um, surrounding our theme for tonight. Um, so uh, Joshua and I will have a conversation. Um, so Joshua, in what ways has the pandemic strengthened the hand of repressive governments in your view? Well, that's a great question, um, Ira. And the, the truth is, I think uh, if we describe our situation uh, this past few months, one could say that it is, these are the best of times and the worst of times. Now, let's start first with the worst of time and just to, uh, to address your question. Like most authoritarian leaders around the world, Duterte initially downplayed the threat of the virus. But when it started, he responded with such a harsh military-like lockdown as if we were actually invaded no, by, foreign, uh, by foreign enemies. Uh, and yet, despite all this, Duterte still failed to contain the virus. They practically mishandled the, the whole situation. And as we speak, more than 51,000 have already been infected and it's still growing. Now, like many authoritarian leaders as well, Duterte used the pandemic to do what they could not have done under normal conditions. For example, first thing they did, you know, they shut down the major TV station that was seen as uh, too critical of the government. And then they phased out jeepneys. These are the cheapest ways uh, for, for workers to, you know, to, to, to travel around the city, um, where more than 100,000 uh, transport workers actually have to uh, rely on, um, driving them into poverty. Many are actually now begging out in the streets. More importantly, he used the pandemic to amass more powers. And here I'm talking about um, the Duterte government rushing into law uh, an anti-terrorism bill that would practically stifle political dissent in the country. So rather than you know, craft bills that will, uh, and laws that will address the numerous problems, the horrendous condition of the working class, they instead, install, uh, instead uh, grab for themselves the power to smash the unions and smash organized forces who are very, very critical of the government. So this, are, there, we are entering very, very challenging times. But I think that would also resonate, uh, some of the things I said would probably resonate in your situation as well, Ira. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, that's um, similar to um, uh, what's happening you know, where I am, which is in Australia. So um, in Melbourne, um, recently, what we've seen is that um, residents in public housing um, towers are being put in hard, dock, hard lockdown um, and they've called police to flood the flats instead of um, bringing in healthcare workers um, to manage the crisis. And this is completely unacceptable because it's basically using um, police authorities to instill fear on people and a lot of the um, people within the uh, people within the community are migrants as well and um, historically there's been a long history of harassment by police um, with these communities and the um, the pandemic has presented this 
problem because repressive governments are taking an opportunity to use it as a as a way to attack people particularly migrants and this is bad it is it is terrible but do you see any silver lining in in this situation from your end yes um i i do just joshua actually um and i think this goes into our next question which we want to talk about. Um, so the next question that we have is, has this crisis opened up new avenues of, re of resistance and possibilities for organizing? And I think the, the answer to that question to me, I think is yes. Um, and I could speak um, uh, on behalf of a lot of the farm workers that I organize with in Australia. So farm workers in Australia are predominantly migrants. Um, they are workers from the Pacific Islands, from Timor-Leste. Um, they're workers from various migrant communities who have lived in Australia for many years. Many of them um, are of Hazara, Nepalese and Cambodian um, workers. Uh, we also have a lot of undocumented workers in Australia um, who are trapped in a very unfair visa system. And um, during the crisis, um, we see that many farm workers are not getting basic needs such as food, proper housing, healthcare, because they're completely excluded from government support. And the crisis has given an opportunity for undocumented workers to fight for an amnesty, um, where they speak up and tell their stories of exploitation on farms to, you know, the major corporations like the major supermarkets, to the media, to the politicians. Um, and also as a result, there has been a lot of push, uh, media push for a call for an amnesty. And um, prior to this crisis, um, it hasn't been very clear that this is something that um, is important and critical. Um, and during this crisis as well, we see that our members reached out to our union asking where can they get food? Because essentially, the, the, like the basic needs are not there for workers. Yeah, yeah. So all they want That's is right. And housing. And we knew that um, a lot of the charity organizations um, were limited. Um, and so uh, as a union, um, we work with um, some allies to raise money um, to support a lot of these undocumented workers. And the fund has actually been used to buy food, winter clothes, um, give medical support, rental support. Um, but but one thing that's really important, uh, an important point here is that um, the farm activists and the farm workers are actually running it. So um, they started the food bank and they've been delivering the food to our union members um, across uh, Melbourne. And we have welfare teams in our agriculture regions that run this food bank. And these are these are things that are run by workers for workers. And this is solidarity. And, you know, um, I'm sure there's some other examples that you could share with us, Joshua, as well, in the Philippines that's similar to this type of solidarity. Well, actually, they, indeed, they, they, there are similar uh, situations here. Like, for example, uh, during a time when the government were not able to, when many governments were not able to, for their constituencies, uh, the people themselves started uh, putting up their own community kitchen, you know, cooking for everyone and started distributing food for everyone. There was also efforts of farmers themselves linking directly with the community to bypass all the, which allowed them to bypass all the, mid, uh, the, the middlemen and, and therefore provide, you know, fresh food uh, to, to the poor who needed it most. But, but for me, the sil so that's great because I haven't seen that kind of uh, outpouring of kindness amidst, amidst a very harsh government that we have. But for me, the, the best part is that I once again see the youth rising up, you know, starting to finally believe in their collective capacities. And that's great. And more importantly, the trade unions have started working together and in fact has even started leading uh, broad coalitions of social movements from, with the peasants, with the women's movement, with the environmental groups, the youth, the urban poor communities, in order to fight back and push back against this anti-terrorism bill that this government uh, is imposing on us right now. So these are these are the best of times, I'd say. And I think and I think uh, we we just need to build up from that, which is going to be hard work, but it can be done. 
So I guess that's uh, about our time. I think so. Yeah. Indeed, it is perfectly on time. Uh, thank you, <laughs> um, Aira. Thank you, Joshua. The best and the worst of times. Yes, I think you said it. Um, we've all seen in our respective countries, I think, uh, a restriction, uh, very strong restrictions on our collective and individual freedoms. You, I mean, even in supposedly non-repressive states, but also we've seen uh, community solidarity kicking in and that's very enthusing. So thank you to you both. And we will move on to our second duo, which uh, consists of Sam Mason, uh, who is a policy officer for the Public and Commercial Services Union of the UK, and Catalina Carogalvis, who represents the Mining and Energy uh, social platform. Please be advised that Catalina will speak in uh, Spanish, so you would need to make sure that you are switched on to the English translation to hear her. So, are they around? I can't see them for the moment. Hi, Mary Christian. I think perhaps I need to speak. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Hello. Fantastic. Thank you. Let's go jump. Yes. Okay, so I, I just need to mute the translation. I'm getting there. <clears throat> um, yeah, thank you very much. Mm. And um, really pleased to be able to participate in this assembly and um, solidarity from my trade union, Public and Commercial Services Trade Union, who's a convener of the assembly in the UK. Um, I think actually Catalina, um, following on from her very important statement at the beginning, um, is really going to reflect in the conversation that we have in terms of our relationships to earth and, and water um, and particularly around the extraction extractivist industry. Um, so I think just in the, the UK at the moment with the twin impacts of the uh, price collapse for oil and gas and the COVID pandemic, it's forecast that the UK oil and gas industry could see as many as 30,000 jobs lost over the next year or so. Six of the trade unions which form an offshore coordinating group have called this the crisis behind the crisis as the pandemic is hiding a bigger industrial crisis for the sector, which was just recovering following a wave of redundancies a few years ago. So there's a workforce that's feeling as though they are treated like a tap that can quite literally be turned on and off when needed. And the unions have rightly said that we need to think differently in response to this. But the call for government equity stakes in the industry, rather than a full pro-public ownership demand to steward the energy transition, fails to take the opportunity of a just transformation of the sector in line with climate and ecological goals, and obviously as well as wider goals for the working class in the um, oil and gas industry. By contrast, um, in the aviation sector, which has faced a similar dramatic collapse, PCS, my union, is calling for a revisioning of the sector as part of a publicly owned integrated transport system with a wider global climate justice perspective. So, Catalina, um, I just wanted to put the question to you. In a situation where in the UK thousands of jobs have been lost in the oil and gas sector as a result of the pandemic, and in Colombia where coal exports have been hit hard, in your work with trade unions there, what can we learn from the experience in Colombia? And can unions internationally use this opportunity to propose real alternatives to extractivism and be stronger advocates for climate justice? Gracias, Sam. Thank you, Sam. I'd like to give hello. I would like to say hello to everybody. So, this is a mixed space that's been done between the union workers in Colombia, 
for the environment to discuss how proposals regarding the transition that can be fair and participative and popular. And they have asked to express our ideas within this space. So before starting to answer your questions, I would like to say hello to Sintra Carbon, our union here in Colombia for Carbon, and we demand the companies to have warranties for the construction of a new collective convention to defend the rights of the workers and to give a fair transition. So in Colombia, what has been done due to this economic model has been really big in the political will of hydrocarbons. Well, we are a supplier of coal, and this has been introduced for Colombia and all the world in negative impacts to the way of life, the economy, water, the environment, the territorial and environmental laws. The Colombian state, well, during these years, has been a complex of all of this and has given our institutions our sovereignty, our land, our minerals, and our oil to the state and to a policy that, as I have said, is a policy that is facing death. It's is helping that. So in this, the workers' union has had to work against transnational consortiums so that this, their, the right to health and to work has been better in, in the context that we live in Colombia, because it sometimes seems that we have a peace agreement, but we're still in in war, and we have great risks within this war context. And one of our officers was threatened. And during the last years, the political agendas of the unions and the coal and energy sectors have advanced to incorporate environmental debates and territorial debates from the devastation that coal and carbon has left on the environment and on the communities that where they are. And regarding the climate crisis that we see is many crises, as one of the panelists was saying before, that has been produced by the capital and that is overlaid to make these differences even bigger. We, of course, believe that the current pandemic that has produced a sanitary emergency in the whole world can be understood as an expression of the devastation in the ecology managed by the capitalism by cycles, and that this has altered the rhythms and the natural cycles, putting the market and capital above life. In this context, we can see that there is a denial of the structural causes for this scenario, and of course, that there is a use of the pandemic Puedes hablar un poco más lentamente, por favor. Parece que es un problema, un bueno, un pequeño problema para la interpretación. Si lo puedes, por favor. Más lentamente. Catalina, Catalina. Me escuches. Okay. Okay. So I was saying that the okay, pandemic. Okay. Perfecto. Perfecto. Discúlpame. <laughs> For okay. the governments of the right, estaba diciendo que la pandemia por parte de los de gobiernos de derecha y de los fascismos pues ha, ha sido y ha permitido implementar medidas antiderechos contra los trabajadores y a favor eh, al igual que como Sam nos comentó ahorita As Sam was en saying Colombia, now, in Colombia Unido, in the Colombia United Kingdom in Colombia we have less work and in the middle of this pandemic, Actualmente ha empezado. So, there has been a work reform the ad hoc that could not be implemented before. So, this related to salaries and social benefits that are given by the governments because of the pandemic and with the excuse to keep the economy afloat. In contrast, in this uh, situation in the working environment with the credits they have been directed to save the investments of the oil and mining industries with passing a certain amount of laws that 
in danger are assets such as an Ecopetrol, the Colombian oil company, and ESA, which is also an energy company. For many years, the right-wing governments have intended to privatize, such as they did with the mining, the oil or petroleum and energy sectors. And these companies are considered by workers as public property. So the pandemic, through these governmental moves to try to focus during centuries has been involved in poverty in informal work and this has promoted or has hidden an intention to alienate the participation of the state in the energy industry and this affects the transnational industry and it is also important for me to say in this pandemic context that it has not been an opportunity to rethink the extraction industry system which is a model that provokes devastation and inequality but the mining companies especially in colombia have used this company to improve their image with donations and charity which is advertising most of all trying to get the approval of the society and also during the isolation measures the energy sector has still been active and the workers have reported the low security measures that they were exposed to showing in many ways that the workers' life, it is just not important for the extraction companies. And lastly, also the national government has announced certain policies that we find very strange, like new thermal plants, such as the ones in Colombia, to give us some energy support to our general industry when in most countries there has been an advance towards the ecology and in Colombia we are focusing on coal as energy production and in the renewable energies well the situation is not very hopeful considering the implementation of new projects is a new license for the investment of transnational capitals which used to invest in fossil fuels and now they're trying to show themselves as green and they are taking more and more lands and continue with their extractionism. In this general overall view that I said so quickly, in this situation, the work of trade unions and the social movements in Colombia have been hopeful and unique. In many places, this encounter between the social and environmental movements, they have been very important to find new joint ways. And I believe that the workers in the mining and energy sectors also Apart from being workers, they are territory subjects and many times they suffer the environmental issues provoked by the extractionism. And this encounter by the organizations has been great to develop common agendas in order to provoke different spaces such as the environmental and ecological organization for the peace. We have been working in, po in the idea to have a post-extractivism world that has to be promoted by the governments where the workers and the societies can discuss from their points of view perspectives their own future taking into consideration their rights and their possibilities to see a future. Also, as our comrade Fido was saying, we need to keep promoting these sustainable initiatives for life that involve energy production in an agroecology and solidarity 
As the people mentioned before, the pandemic has allowed us to see the farmers and indigenous solidarity that are taking food to the communities and continue to focus on life. So this is an opportunity. We think that the discussions of this transition help us think that this transition cannot be focused on the right-wing governments and in favor of the companies or eco-fascisms that still give an advantage to capital. So I think that the working class and the social movements are thinking about a radical transition that is already underway in the territories and allows us to create a future without the extractivism with environmental justice from and for the peoples. This is the road and the hope that we have and that we have been carrying out here in Colombia. I'm afraid, I'm sorry, I always speak so fast. Uh, thank you. Um, Irene would like to uh, add something. <clears throat> Irene would like to add a few things at this juncture, so I will let her jump in. Oh, I'm sorry, that was probably unclear. We were just going to run a poll um, from the previous pair, not to interrupt the current pair, but I just wanted to um, let people know and then to give a pause when the poll runs to let the interpreters give a chance to interpret that, but I don't want to disrupt the current. Uh yeah, it'll be after Catali the air. Uh, okay, fine. Yeah. Catalina had finished, so I wonder whether Sam would like to come back. Um, that, that's fine, Mary Christian. Um, and, and really, obviously, appreciate the, the comments from Catalina, and I, I think that that's inspiring that we need to look forward and how we can work together building this global platform mm. between the trade unions and social movements around the mm. extractivist industry. Okay, thank you, Sam. Um, so thank, thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, Catalina. Uh, most interesting. Definitely, we we see um, we see the same problems of extractivism with companies trying to whitewash or greenwash their image uh, everywhere. Indeed, French multinational companies are very uh, guilty of that as well. Um, I think the fact that um, there is such a platform between unions and environmental organization is most interesting, uh, but it is also a very great source of concern in terms of the number of people who are regularly getting harassed when not killed uh, and continue to do so in Colombia. And that is something that as a trade union movement, we are following extremely closely. So thank you to you both. And now, yes, indeed, Irene, it's all yours. There is a poll that has just appeared on your screen. Um, if interpreters could interpret the question, was the COVID pandemic used by your national government to increase their power and corporate power? That is from um, the previous pair, Joshua and Ira. So folks could respond to that and then we'll close it. Um, and if the interpreters could read that. Thank you. Thank you. So I believe we can continue with our third panel. And our third panel is going to involve as John Van, who is a retired activist from the a Norwegian union, union sorry, of municipal and general employees, but who remains uh, a tireless worker on trade union climate issues. And with him will be Michael Michel Silva, who is International Secretary of the uh, Metal Workers uh, Federation of CUT Brazil. So Ashbourne, Maicon, please can you enable your videos? So we can see you. I think it should work now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can see you. Yes. Hello, Ashton. So the floor is uh, yours. Hello, uh, Marie Christine, and thank you for that. Um, it's great also to, to meet uh, my con. Uh, it's, it's great to, to be in different 
parts of the world and go to the same meeting like this. Um, so I thought I should start by uh, raising a couple of questions to Mycon. Um, as has already been quite clear to everybody is that we live in very difficult times with crisis all around us. So the question is how to how to meet that enormous challenging situation. Uh, what we do now and do experience every day, I think, around in the world is that the employers are very good at exploiting the crisis. They use the crisis to the benefit of themselves. Uh, like what Naomi Klein described so eminently in, in her shock doctrine work. They are, they are clever in doing that. The question is, are we as good in using this situation? Because it is an opening also for the trade union movement in the current situation of crisis everywhere. And, and um, I should like to to hear from from uh, comrade Mike Mikeon from from uh, Metal Workers Union in in, in Brazil in Kut. Uh, not least on the basis of his uh, experience from this union, which is a very very powerful trade union with a strong tradition of of, of struggle. Not least in in defeating the military dictatorship in in the 1980s in Brazil. So so, what is your uh, advice in the current situation, Michael, or, or, or on how to meet the current situation when we have face uh, a multitude of crises, health, economic, political, climate, food, uh, and so on. Do we have the organizational structures that we need to meet the enormous challenges? And what changes is needed if, if, if we need to change in the way we organize our unions on the ground? Thank you very much, comrades, all of you here present. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to be able to share these ideas. First of all, I would like to say that in Brazil, we were already very, very bad in our situation before the pandemic. We were already here with a government that is worldwide known, unfortunately, for their contributions and actions. They are a government that now we can see very sadly an indignation and with a strong fight to change. For example, yesterday and the day before, the government passed a law that doesn't allow the Brazilian state to give masks or alcohol to the indigenous peoples. So here in the Amazonian, this is a genocide policy that is underway in Brazil. And this is also present in the working class, for example, in the case of Maria Lufranco, and all the prosecutions that people can see in Brazil nowadays. And in this way, I have felt a crisis which needs a structural solution. The unions, the working organizations have to work jointly in order to fight together. For a long time, the concept of working class, and when we say class, we are talking about the people who sell their labor for an income to survive, and that applies to basically everybody or everything. But many times, in our history, see in our activity, in our industry, in our collective bargain deals and our representative base, at the moment, we are going through this structural crisis 
and what we have to do, the working classes at the world level is change and deepen the improvement of the structures of the unions. For example, it's no longer possible to talk about a metal working industry or chemical unit when the whole industry, all the industry capitals are attacking as a coordination to all the working class. So it is paramount that we change. And as Fido explained before, we need to see the supply chains because the supply chains is where we have to be present. Our voice must be there. It cannot be possible that we get good collective bargains and those in the supply chain have a very low wage and precarious conditions. And I believe that this structure change is a road. And another road, and I share our comrades' idea, is that we have to coordinate a strike worldwide coordinated, organized by region with all our colleagues, our comrades in America. The Americas today are going through a very bad situation regarding democracy with the imperialist countries, like Kathleen said. So I do not believe that this is correct and we need to deepen our nationalization and direct actions and we need to do and give these contributions and conventions and organizations and like the climate forum and i am convinced that capitalism only care about money so when we hurt their pockets and their money they will start to listen to the working class hey great to hear um, i totally agree I, I, I find it very interesting that you're talking about, that you are not discussing this question of, of unifying the, the working class itself, that we have to go away from this uh, sectionalism that we have in, in many trade unions and, and organize them based on class rather than on skill on trade. I think that is extremely important in the current situation. It also forces us to develop uh, unifying demands from the these organizations in order to first of all unify the, the working class that is important but we need wider alliances as well uh, we need to build uh, alliances with other organizations social movements and all these kind of things so what is your view on that perfect comparto Excellent, yeah. Uh, most trade unions uh, have for a long time been calling for another economic model, uh, we have heard. We heard it also in, in, in this uh, assembly, which uh, a model which pri prioritizes people before profit, as they say, or as we say, in, in other words, a socialist model. Uh, and I know that your union have the socialism in its statues. But uh, after the pandemic is over, we will still be faced with a number of, of crises, it is economic, political, social, and so on, so on, so on, so on. So how do we sort of, uh, are, are we prepared to launch or to strengthen our struggle for another system, a socialist solution? And if, if so, in which ways are we go going to to put energy into that kind of struggle uh, in in the near future? Or how do we take it from words to action? In in other words. Wonderful. Excellent question. I believe that first of all the change process is actually a process so we not only after the pandemic but also since this moment have to strengthen this agenda because in this moment I think this is a critical point during the pandemic 
because it is now that we are seeing a frontal attack to the organizational structures for the working class directly. And it is in this moment that we have a strengthening of the companies and the transnational multinational groups who affect the social organizations in all the world. This is a scandal. It's a scandal. For example, in my country, there is a process, there is a law that enables all the Guarani aquifers, which is the biggest water pool in the world, is going to be privatized. So this is a scandal. We have, during this period, before the end of the pandemic, we have to show the way to the workers, the workers in a huge sense of the word. So I believe that we need to start debating and constantly in touch with the working class that we do have an alternative. We have a proposal as an alternative, and as you say, this is a socialist society. And there must be a, a, an understanding of what would be socialist, what would be in, what would be out. But we are talking about a production that measures the well-being and not the profits for the company or the owners. So I believe that this is the time, is the key time to start taking clear political stances and we should not be afraid and we must show that we do have a socialist alternative that can improve the situation that we're going through right now. Yeah. Thank you. Ash Ashbon, do you want to add anything? Uh, just just uh, just to close it um yes. discussion. Uh, I, th I think it is extremely important for the trade union movement to, now to start to, to st discuss and talk about the power because it's the power that we that we need in the current situation. Uh, this will be a power struggle, and I think it was it was interesting to see the poll, uh, the poll about whether or not we were aware of, of strength, and it was a. Uh, quite a lot of people that think that we are not aware of our strength. That means to me that I interpret that as saying that we are stronger than we than we look like in the current situation. And particularly in the North, I think we are the, the, the trade unions uh, are in a sort of a defensive situation for many years and, and being more or less used to that. So they, they dare not take the step into the confrontation and the fight that we really need to have in order to develop have a different development. So go for power and develop a strategy to support that. Thank you. So thank you. thank you, Ashbon. Obrigada, Maicon. Um, uh, I think um, you are uh, what you mentioned about the power that we need to uh, gain. I think is an important aspect. Indeed, probably are we too much on the defensive rather than being on the offensive when it comes to defending workers' rights when it comes to also uh, stating our claim in terms of workers' needs and those of our class, as Micon described it, should uh, be sort of placed in the forefront of those of large multinational companies. And uh, just as, a, as an apart from that, I could mention that there are negotiations going on in uh, Geneva on an international uh, binding treaty on multinational companies that quite a lot more organizations could actually get involved in, and that would be very helpful. So, um, can I move on to the last panel, if uh, everybody agrees? And this last panel uh, will be between Kelsey Cameron, who is an internet, the International Solidarity Officer 
of the Canadian of public and uh, Canadian Union, sorry, of public employees, and with it will be with Justina jo Jonas Emula, who is General Secretary of the Metal and Allied Namibian Workers Union. Um, so, uh, Kelty, Justina, please start your videos. Hello. Thank you, Marie Christine. Good afternoon, Justina. Good afternoon, Kelty. Um, so, um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity uh, to speak with you today. And also, I think that our previous comrades have laid a, a good foundation for the discussion that we'll have for the next couple minutes. Um, so, time is tight, so I think we'll just jump in and because we want to hear from you. Um, and to start, can you uh, outline some of the challenges that the COVID-19 pandemic has created for workers and trade unions in Namibia? And can you specifically speak to the situation of the sector you work for, which is the construction sector? Okay, thank you very much, Katie, and hi to everyone. Um, maybe just for, on short to give you a brief on where we are standing as a country. We are now at 593 and not death yet, but um, the, the, the region which is more affected currently now is the Western region. And we understand that the fishing industry, the workers who are working in the fishing industry, they are more affected now in terms of being positive. And I think the number among the 593, they are the one currently made up that number. In the construction industry currently, we have not heard of any case yet. Uh, however, the, there are challenges now in terms of condition of employment. Uh, before um, the COVID-19, we have common challenges facing the sector. But after immediately the president have declared the state of emergency, we have then seen the panic in the industry because there was no any law regulating the, there was no law regulating the, 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 the pandemic. However, um, man who was also involved on the tripartite um, forum, which is employers and employees uh, in the state to agree on specific uh, regulations in terms of what should happen with the workers and employers in the movement. And the part of those discussions, we have then agreed at the national level, government level to say there will be no retrenchment, no workers will be forced to go and leave. Um, there will be no any, um, uh, workers to, to, to reduce salaries, they must pay full salaries. However, we have realized that employers have then back off from the agreement, but we were very happy from the workers to see that the president have agreed to, with the tripartite forum, even though the employers decided to, to take him to court to say he does not have constitutional rights to proclamate that um, employers are prohibited to retrench workers. They went to court, the employers, they won the case, However, we are still um, we are still have that now uh, the issue of saying they have won, and we understand that the government is going to appeal that because employers they really want to retrench, they just want to retrench. Um, although we have then agreed that they should not retrench, but we we still have that confidence as um, as workers in this country, especially in the construction industry, to say we are still protected by our labor act, our our Labor Act, which is protecting us, there are sections which is really protecting the workers. And say, even if you want to retrench, there are certain uh, sections you need to follow um, in terms of if you want to, you cannot just retrench as you wish. There are restrictions which you need to, 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 to adhere to. And if you don't adhere, it will declare a null and void. So at present, I think in the industry, it's a bit calm uh, because during the, the trip at that forum, we also agree that the government stimulates package must also include the construction um, industry, both the employers to benefit and as well as the workers in terms of wage subsidy, uh, because the sector is, uh, is a sector which involves uh, work, um, no work, no pay. If you don't do anything, you will not be paid. So we then agree that uh, the government have agreed construction sector is part of the stimulate package and the workers who found themselves were not paid by the government, by the employers they were then paid by the, the government through the social security uh, social security protection, which protection. So th those were the issues. Besides the other one, uh, the other challenges we had is the issue of leave. 
workers were, some of them were forced to go and leave, but we have handled those ones after lockdown, which is not really a major issue. Otherwise, overall, currently, the sector is stabilized. We are now monitoring the appeal of government um, against the employer, which is one the case they want to retrench. But only minimum, uh, minimum. So far, we have not really received a major um, retrenchment notices from the sector. But other sectors we are receiving, but for, because the sector is guaranteed in the stimulus package, I think it has given a bit of, of stability in, in the sector. But uh, the, 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 the people who probably were now giving notice, these are very small local contractors who have never had jobs before and they cannot sustain the, the workers. So retrenchment become inevitable based on that sketch. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so you're speaking um, specifically to the context of COVID and certainly it appears that the, the, the target uh, or the, the, the struggle is um, with the predatory employers at the moment. And, and um, I think that what we wanna hear a bit more about is the context in which um, you are engaged in this struggle currently. So I know that um, multinationals, especially Chinese corporations, have created real challenges for workers in the sector in your country and also throughout the continent of Africa. And so in response, your union, I understand, has been running a campaign that's calling for the localization of the construction companies and the workforce for projects under um, public contract. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about that um, because that's that is the context uh, prior to this pandemic. Yes, Katsi. I think one of the things of currently we are saying um, in terms of now what, what will happen after COVID. Um, but the issue also of the campaign, it's not just because of, of COVID, but it's something we started way back. Um, the first campaign we started with it, it was 2007. That is when uh, when we see many uh, multinational companies, multinational companies coming in the sector, we confronted government Then there was a change. We now realize that 2016, the same attitude is coming back again of multinational Chinese company coming in, in, in the sector, dominating more especially the major companies. 2016, we lost a lot of members. Um, our membership, uh, we lost about 45% uh, 45, 45 of our membership just simply because the local big companies have... You're muted. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, many local local contractors have lost lots of many major projects and every project coming in the sector is just awarded to the Chinese or a Chinese in the joint venture with the local. And once you are in the joint venture, the Chinese will buy you out and the Chinese will stay in that the joint, um, the joint venture alone. So we then realized that these local big companies, they are employing workers with sustainable jobs and compared to the Chinese um, multinational companies who they, they have created unsustainable jobs. Workers have not, uh, they are not uh, the gist of social security, no medical aid. Uh, there is no any social benefit. There, was, there is not just nothing. Although now these challenges facing them, we then say, look, as much as we start campaigning against them, we also need to ensure that they also comply with our national laws. But at the same time, we also need to confront government to say, we have local big companies who can also be multinational companies. Why can't they give a chance for them to be able to do this job? And when you do that also, you are also growing your local economy because now if you give to a Chinese, you are also, um, that money is going to another country's um, economy. So you are actually necessarily not growing your economy. Um, and at the same time also in terms of uh, creating jobs, we have seen that the jobs created by these projects are not of sustainability. But then if you compare to the locals, these are sustainable jobs, workers have benefit, workers have long work long in the company, there is no issues of hiring, firing, and we then decided we need to confront this. We have done it before 2007, we should do it again, and I think it should be in such a way that we are not, pro, uh, we are unapologetic about it, because at the end of the day, this bilateral agreement be, 
between our countries in Africa uh, with the Chinese, we are the one at the end of the day going to pay this loan. It's our tax money going to pay this loan. But if you are not investing back in the country, how do we expect us to pay this loan? Because at the end of the day, we're gonna end, um, we're gonna be debted to to China. They're not gonna start taking over our, our infrastructures because we owe them. So we need to start now to for us to protect ourselves and also to protect our country over this, um, uh, you know, um, somehow um, uh, colonization which we do not see. Uh, we, we which we need to safeguard before we go into the matter. Although we are already there, but it did need to be. To be, to be safeguard from our side. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And you mentioned um, at the beginning, uh, made reference to stimulus package. And I know that um, a lot of countries and unions will, this will resonate, um, calls for funding into investment and uh, economic recovery strategies post COVID. And so I'm wondering how you see this campaign and your union having an influence over uh, these economic uh, strategies of the government to ensure that it's a people's recovery that serves workers rather than the foreign corporate sector? Yes, um, we, we, the, the, uh, our government have, have put up an 8 billion stimulus package. In that eight billion stimulus package, um, that gap it need to be filled up, coming from somewhere, and we believe that the construction sector is one of the leg in the in our in our economy can be able to to help to grow that economy. Now, if you have uh, major projects which are multi-millionaire projects going on going out to the multinational companies who are not Namibians. Uh, that money is shipped out of the country rather than to stay in the country and be able to assist the government to fill up this gap, uh, which they have assisted during the, the COVID-19. Uh, currently, if we rely on our, if we rely on on on, on loans uh, from different um, different different um, d- different countries, we will be then left with no option but. To, to be in debt as a country and we cannot be able to create jobs which is necessary to be able to take care of, 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 of the citizen in the country to be able to safeguard whatever needed to be safeguard. So we are saying in the construction industry, if we explore this and be able to support local, it will help government to grow its economy uh, rather than to give to other countries to grow other and we see that it's one of the strategies can be able to assist them. Mm-hmm. And ourselves Thanks. Thanks. And I think that, um, you know, I, I appreciated this opportunity where we're coming to a close, but I do, um, uh, I, I do think it's really important that we're really hear very quickly what's happening on the ground in Namibia. And also the title of this section is Workers Without Borders. And I think that, that your introduction to your campaign to localize industry to ensure the industrial capacity is strengthened within the country um, is really important and to know about. And also um, organizing against the imposition of predatory foreign corporations um, really does lay the foundation for unified demands with workers around the world. I work for a public sector union in Canada and can certainly see the parallels between your fight um, to, to localize industry with our fight against privatization, for nationalization, for expanded public sector. And so I think that um, our earlier comrades making the point around the unity of public and private sector, <clears throat> and also thinking about how we as working class across borders can, can struggle moving forward is, is, is really important. And it's, um, it's really inspiring to hear that you've been campaigning actively within your union. Um, And so I think we need to wrap it up. Um, I don't know if you have just a very quick comment about how you see the the need, or no, we're we're done. Okay. (laughs) Thank you, Justina. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you, Kelty. Thank you, Justina. I'm sorry to cut you a little short. Um, where we are, in fact, running out of time. And so I want to thank uh, all of you who have spoken this morning uh, or afternoon, evening, depending on your time zone, for all you've said. Now, I, would, I was going to take a minute of your time. I will take 30 seconds of your time um, to sort of speak on behalf of of my own organization. And to do so, I'm going to um, I'm going to break into French, so please be advised. Donc, euh, ainsi que Sean l'a indiqué au, de, au début de notre, de notre réunion. Je mentionne it euh, at the beginning de, of uh, our meeting. I am from CGT, et, France, euh, départ, of the euh, General CGT Confederation of Workers, and euh, we uh, decided to invest que, in this euh, fight because euh, it was really important because we knew uh, that this uh, crisis, the sanitary uh, crisis that we all sens, know in our countries is going to give more a sense, a broader sense to the notion of solidarity as we know it. We have the opportunity to fight together and all these meetings that are going to be uh, scheduled in July and August will be, and September will be very important to win new battles and to be uh, united in the name of CGTP and in name of Philippe Martinez or Secretary General. I would like to wish you all a lot of courage to fight all these uh, adverse uh, conditions. And once again, thank you. I'm going to uh, uh, give the floor to Anas Benabar, who uh, is the Secretary General of the Gas and Electricity of uh, Tunisia. Would you like to activate the video, please? Uh, thank you, dear friends. I would like to wish you uh, all the best and uh, give you all the possibility to share my concern with all the workers of our sector, electricity and gas, and especially with the new uh, revolutionary wave that we are seeing. It is an opportunity for us to share or our concern for the trade unions, but also to share our ideas, our experience, and we can submit all our comments in the uh, internet side of the assembly. Dear friends, dear comrades, you should be active. You should be reacting. You should create a new world and you should share with us the new ideas. And I hope, dear comrades, that we will be able to draft new texts and new projects for the future. It is a very important for the new results uh, that are going to be transmitted through the site of or unions. Thank you so much for your Thank you, Elias. I would kindly ask that all um, the uh, participants, all the uh, people who took part in this meeting, please enable your videos so that we can be seen by all the attendees. We want to thank all the attendees. We want to thank all the participants. Uh, we want to thank the organizers, of course, of this meeting, the conveners, but also we need to thank the interpreters without whom this meeting could not have been held. And I think as a closing remark and as a tribute also to our colleagues in South Africa, I would just like us all to say Amandla. 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 Bye-bye. Uh, see, see you all in August. August. 20th of August. August 20. August. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to you. Yeah. Thank you Work around everyone. the clock. Bye. Uh, Irene, can I ask a technical question? Well, there's a lot of interesting stuff in the Q&A uh, and the chat. I assume you will cut and paste and make that available somewhere.
Yes, we plan to post questions that were generated from this meeting to the website. And um, we will try to make a function so that other people can respond to the questions um, through the website, um, typing responses or comments or asking more questions uh, off of those questions. So we wanted to make this interactive and we look forward to hearing from everyone in that process. And Irene, allow me on behalf of the convening and working group to thank you, Sean, John, Lala, for your work. I did it in the intro. I'm doing it again. We can't say thank you enough for the work that you guys have done and keep on keeping on all the way through the summer <laughs> so that we'll see again in August with new speakers, new tools. Again, thank you. The four Supported. Of you. Thanks, David. Supported. Thanks, Asbjorn. Motion. A lot, a lot of texts from encouraging texts into WhatsApp. 